welcome to take notes or write down any names or dates or anything else you think is important. Uh, but uh, this is not going to be, some cases stretch on for weeks, and therefore notes can be important in helping jurors uh, remember uh, what took place some time ago. The, um, the, you've been given juror badges to wear. Uh, it's important that you wear them when you go out into the hallways and use the elevators and the first floor. Because people who work in the courthouse know that if you're on a jury, uh, you should not be approached or spoken to in, in any way. Uh, and uh, I doubt anyone would try to speak to you about that about this case, if that were to be the occasion, as you told one of the court officers or myself. Uh, but you will also find that the lawyers won't say hello or goodbye or anything else to you. And that's because uh, everybody who works here and tries cases here know that verbal and eye communication with jurors is just not uh, a pro proper part of the etiquette. So uh, don't feel that anybody's being rude to you by not being um, conversant. Uh, it's also very important that you not discuss the case with anyone, including discussing it among yourselves until all the evidence and the arguments are over and you're deliberating. Uh, the reason for that is that <coughs> some of you may arrive at a reaction to a particular witness early on. And uh, you, you're entitled to that. But you should keep that to yourself, because you should wait until the cross-examination is done, until <coughs> all the evidence is in, and all the arguments are done, before you make any final decision. And if you were to give your immediate reaction to another juror, they might consider that as sort of an, an improper way to try and influence them or something like that, because they may not have had the same reaction. So when you're back in the jury room, uh, or having a recess, or to come back from lunch early, or whatever, please remember, just keep uh, the discussion away from this case. You can talk about uh, the Eagles, or talk about the Phillies, or talk about shopping, or grandchildren, or children, whatever you like, but don't talk <coughs> about the case until you're ready to deliver. Now, uh, uh, when, when witnesses are called, there's four, four different types of testimony. The party who calls the witness starts out the question of what we call direct examination, where the, where the uh, questions relate to what the witness knows of his, his or her own personal knowledge. Then the opposing counsel gets to cross-examine the witness and may want to challenge the witness on the witness's recollection or credibility or anything else that's relevant. Then the party that called the witness has a chance to ask redirect questions to bring up or try to clarify anything that came on the cross-examination. And lastly, the opposing counsel then gets a final chance of what we call re-cross-examination uh, which is usually confined to what happened on the direct examination. Now, counsel are under obligation to object to testimony when they feel it is improper under the rules of evidence. And it's my job to rule on the objection. The objections are not addressed to you. They're addressed to me as the judge. And you should not uh, consider the objections in any way in determining the facts of the case. <coughs> if I overrule the objection, that means I find that the question was proper and the witness can testify as to the uh, question. If I sustain the objection, that means I find that the question is improper, and if the witness has already answered the question, I may tell you to strike it, which means you should ignore it. Do not hold it against one party or the other because the attorney uh, objects or makes objections. That's the lawyer's job to object during the trial. So you should not pay any attention to it or the influence of your work. The only other thing I want to say is that um, you're welcome, I think I said, you're welcome to bring the drink in or keep it at your desk. We take a mid-morning recess, uh, and then uh, well, lunch will be uh, maybe a little longer than an hour today because we have a judge's meeting, and then uh, we have mid-afternoon recess, and we uh, do not uh, sit any later than 4.30. Okay, that completes the preliminary instructions, so we're now waiting for the prosecution to open up. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Dama, ladies and gentlemen, the jury, good morning. On August the 10th of 2011, at about a quarter to 12 uh, midnight, Officers John Terry and Robert McEwen were working as members of the Philadelphia Police Department. They were in a marked police car and they were in full uniform and they were driving in the area of 17th and Butler Streets here in Philadelphia. They first observed a man walking uh, northbound on 17th Street, and he looked in their direction uh, and then yelled out, 
yo, yo, one time, one time. Now, the officers will tell you that that language in urban slang means police, police. Within seconds of hearing that cry, they heard five to eight gunshots down 17th Street. Officer Terry will tell you, tell you that he saw a person on a porch about three quarters of the way down the block, and he saw that person run into the house. He saw only one other person down the block on the west side, and that person turned out to be the defendant in this case, Ryan Seals. He saw Mr. Seals on the sidewalk about one to two houses away from the person that he had seen run into, into the house from the porch. Both officers will tell you that they saw Mr. Seals, who originally was turned away from the officers, turn towards them, sort of fall slightly to the ground, then turn around completely and start walking towards them. And almost immediately they saw him make a motion with his right arm, throwing an object into the bushes on the street. They will tell you later on that that object is consistent with a handgun in size and shape. Mr. Seals then continued down the street towards the officers, put his hands up in the air and said they're shooting. And he eventually was stopped by Officer Terry. Officer McEwen went over to the bush where they had seen Mr. Seals again make that motion and throw an object into the bushes. And after a thorough search of the bush, he found one object, uh, this handgun, which is a 380 semi-automatic handgun that had one bullet in the magazine and had one bullet in the chamber. The police will also tell you that they found in the same area where they had first seen Mr. Seals two what they call fired cartridge cases, these two little guys here, which basically are what is ejected from the gun after a gun is fired. And they found those two on the sidewalk right near the bush where Officer McEwen found the gun. You're going to hear testimony from a firearms expert that he did an analysis, first of all, of the uh, gun and these fired cartridge cases. And he will tell you that based on his analysis, the fire cartridge cases, these two little cases, came from this same gun that Officer McEwen found in the bushes. He will also tell you that he tested the gun itself and that it's operable, it's capable of firing a projectile. Now, the charges in this case, or the charge in this case, is that Mr. Seals is charged with being a felon in possession of a firearm and ammunition. His Honor will tell you somewhere down the line that there are basically three elements uh, that make up that charge. Number one, that the defendant knowingly possessed, had in his possession, the firearm and the ammunition. Secondly, that the possession of that firearm was in or affecting interstate or foreign commerce. Uh, now, the government can prove that element by simply showing that this gun uh, was made in a foreign country or came in to Pennsylvania from another state. You're going to find, uh, you'll hear testimony that this gun was actually uh, manufactured in Spain, and you can see on the gun itself that uh, it brought in through Alexandria, Virginia. Furthermore, there's a stipulation or an agreement between the defense and the government in this case that the firearm and the ammunition did impact interstate commerce. So to that extent, that, that decision is already made for you if you choose to accept it. The third element that the government has to prove is that the defendant previously was convicted of a crime punishable by imprisonment for a term exceeding one year. And again, there is a stipulation or an agreement between the defendant and the defense and the government in this case that that is so, that he has that prior 
a conviction for a term exceeding one year of, of potential imprisonment. So in effect, ladies and gentlemen, what, what the issue before you is, is whether Ryan Seals possessed this gun uh, on August the 10th of 2011. And that's the decision for you to make. And as his honors already indicated earlier, how you go about doing that is by watching the witnesses when they testify from that witness stand, determining their credibility, and in effect determining what the truth is in this case. At the conclusion of this case, based upon the truths that you find coming from that witness stand from the witnesses, Ms. Maggie is going to stand up in front of you and ask you to convict Ryan Seals of being a felon in possession of a handgun, a firearm, and ammunition in this case. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Adamo, you want to address the jury at this time? Yes, sir. Go ahead. This case comes down to observation, a correct observation or an incorrect observation that determines whether or not we find my client guilty or not guilty. I ask that you listen to the direct examination as the government will lay out its case with exhibits. I also ask that you listen to the cross-examination. At the conclusion of this case, Your Honor, Judge Bellison will charge you. One of the most important charges deals with the whole concept of reasonable doubt. And that hinges pretty much on whether you feel that the government has proved this case beyond a reasonable doubt as to whether my client actually possessed this weapon. <clears throat> You'll get, uh, you'll get an idea of the area. You'll get a very good idea of the area through the exhibits. You'll get an idea of the lighting conditions. You'll get an idea, of, you'll get a feel of, of what the officers went through when they made their observations. And then it'll be up to you, relying on your common sense and your common impressions to determine this particular case, <coughs> the innocence or guilt of Mr. Seals. And <clears throat> I ask you to consider the direct examination, but I also ask you to consider the cross-examination. I also, I also ask you to listen very carefully, very carefully to Judge Bailson's charge at the conclusion of the case dealing with reasonable doubt, because it's defense position that the government will not be able to prove beyond a reasonable <coughs> doubt that my client possessed a weapon. And uh, at the end of the case, I'll have an opportunity to address you. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're now ready for the first witness. Call us a terror, Your Honor. John Terry, T E R R Y. Thank you. Please speak into the microphone. May I proceed, Your Honor? Also, Terry, uh, good morning. Good morning. Let me call your attention to the date of August the uh, 10th, 2011, at about uh, 15 minutes until midnight. Were you working as a Philadelphia police officer at that time? Yes, sir. And were you, uh, how, how were you working? Were you marked car, a marked car, plain clothes, whatever? Uh, marked car in full uniform. Okay. Were you working by yourself or with a partner? I had a partner. Okay. And who was your partner? At that um, time? McEwen. Okay. Robert McEwen? Yes. Okay. Uh, were you in the area of uh, 17th and Butler Streets at about that time? Yes, sir. 
Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you saw as you were in that area. Um, we were traveling northbound on 17th Street. Um, 17th Street is two ways. It's uh, one lane in each direction with parking on one side of the street. Um, we were traveling northbound. I observed a male walking on the east sidewalk. Um, he looked over in our direction and he started to yell, um, one time, one time. And he cupped his hands up over his mouth and he yelled again, yo, yo, one time, one time. All right, just let me uh, interrupt you, officer, for a minute. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I just, uh, I don't do this frequently, but I, uh, I just want to make a, uh, give you a preliminary instruction about this testimony. Uh, you have, uh, you've heard the, this witness testify about what another person said, this other individual that you described. Now, as a, uh, as a general rule in, uh, in law, that we only allow witnesses to testify as to what they uh, did or what they said themselves or what they observed with their eyes or ears, the sense. We don't uh, generally allow uh, witnesses to testify as to what other people said. Uh, however, as with just about every other rule, there are exceptions <coughs> to that rule. And one exception to that rule is where somebody makes a present sense impression. Now let me go back and give you an example of what I mean by that. When we're going to talk about you know, a civil case, and we're going to talk about <coughs> right angle collision like I talked about before. So let's say we have this uh, two cars and they go through a red light. Uh, one of them goes through a red light. There's a dispute about who went through a red light and who's bystander. And uh, there's a trial that takes place where the two drivers are suing each other, and one of these bystanders testifies. going is, and there's testimony about the bystander, not from the bystander himself or herself. And one of the witnesses wants to bring out something that the bystander said just minutes or seconds after the accident happened, such as the Buick went through the red light, okay? That is what the, the law would consider a present sense impression that is defined as follows. It's a statement describing or explaining an event or condition made while the declarant, that is the person who made the statement, was perceiving the event or condition or immediately thereafter. So in that situation, the by, what the bystander said would be admissible as a present sense impression, even if the bystander himself or herself was not the witness. Okay? Maybe they're not, because they moved away, or maybe they died, they're not available, but, but somebody else could testify as to what they heard the bystander say seconds after the crash. Similarly here, uh, this witness, the police officer, is being allowed to uh, testify as to what this third party said uh, what he heard him say uh, right at that minute, okay? Because uh, according to the officer's testimony, he's observing the police officer and he's calling out in the street language uh, the fact that police officers are there. So that's a present sense of pressure. Now, another reason why this um, testimony may be considered by you, but not, but not for the truth of the matter, uh, is I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to uh, hold off instructing you on that right here. And we'll wait for some more testimony. Go ahead. When, when you heard this man uh, yell out, yo, yo, one time, one time, were you, you the driver of the car or the passenger of the car? I was the passenger. So he was closer to you than, than to your partner? Yes, he was on my side. And did you subsequently find out the identity of that person who yelled out, uh, yo, yo, one time, one time? Yes. And what was his name? Um, Brian Seals. Um, when you heard this, what was the next thing that happened? I, I heard gunshots. Okay. Within how short a period of time? Almost immediately. Okay. Could you tell how many gunshots you heard at that point? Um, about four to six, four to seven. Okay. And what did you see or do at that point? Um, well, as soon as I heard the gunshots, I looked up the direction where they were coming from. They were coming from um, in front of us. Okay. Um, Could you tell whether the left side of the street or right side of the street at that point? It would have been my left, the west side of the street. Okay. 
And what, if anything, did you see when you looked up the street? I observed someone run into a house. Okay. And I observed the defendant. Um, he turned towards us, stumbled, threw something with his right hand off to his side. Um, he then put his hands up, and he came running towards us. Okay. Let me take it back. So okay, we'll now, wait. just a minute. Let me interrupt. Now you've heard the officer testify um, concerning his observation concerning the defendant uh, clients. I mean, remember there are two uh, two people for the last name seal. Clients was B R Y N, and the officer testified he later in his identity. He's the one who made the statement, uh, according to the officer's testimony. The defendant's name is Ryan C. It's R Y A N. So you have to be careful in knowing of either of those is mentioned that we understand. Who the witness is talking about. Now, in this situation, um, the officer describes certain conduct by the defendant. Now, that's for you to determine what, what exactly what happened. But one of my instructions to you is that you may consider um, the statement made by Brian Seals, the RYA and the brother, that the officers heard if you find the statement was made, as the officer testified. You may find, you may consider that, not for the truth of the matter, sir, but that a statement was made uh, that was heard, may have been heard, <coughs> yes, sir, that's for you to determine, by the defendant. And that may have had some effect on him, and may have caused him to do what the officer saw him do. Now, this is a question of uh, evidence and of uh, fact for you to determine based on the testimony uh, and the arguments of counsel and the instructions that I'll give you at the end of the case. Okay, thank you. Do your counsel want to see me at sidebar about that? No, sir. No, no thank you. Yeah. Right, <coughs> Let me take you back, officer. You said when you first looked up, you saw someone running into a house. Is that correct? Yes. Where was that person when you first saw him? Um, he was up on the porch between the door and the house. Okay. And then you said you saw a second person who you identified as a defendant, all right? Yes. Who are you, who are you referring to in this court as a defendant, by the way? How was, how was he dressed? Brian Seals. Okay. How was he dressed? Um, white shirt, suit jacket, black suit jacket. Okay. Stipulate. Okay. In the cave, for the record, the defendant in this case, Ryan Seals, you're on. Where did you first see uh, Mr. Ryan Seals when, when you looked up? He was on the um, west side of the street. Okay. We're in relationship to the person that you saw run into the into the porch, uh, from the porch into the house. He was on the sidewalk. Okay, but ten houses down, a couple houses down. About two houses. Okay. Um, and was his back to you first, or his, or his face to you when you first saw him? If you his back was to us first. Okay. Did you see anyone else on that west side of the street other than the person who ran into the, from the porch into the house and the defendant in this case? No. But when you heard the gunshots, were, were, was your car still moving up the street or had it stopped at that point? We were still moving. Okay. Did you eventually stop? Yes. What did you do at that point? Well, I, let, let me, before you do that, you said you saw Mr. Seals turn and he threw something. Is that right? Yes. Could you tell exactly what that object was at that point in time? No. Um, what kind of motion do you make when he threw the object? Um, a sideways show us, your, show, us your arm. show us with your arm what you saw. Stand up and uh, show the jury. It was a sideways motion. Okay. And it came right just from the side. To the right, Your Honor, from the body out to uh, out to the side. And then you said you saw Mr. Seals coming down the street. And what did he do at that point? He put his hands up. Did you then, at some later point, see your partner? Officer McEwen look into the area where you would see Mr. Seals throw the object. Yes. And and where where did the object land, if you know? Did you see where it went? Off to the right side, um, with the lawns when there's a bush there. Okay. So into the bush? Yes. Did you see your partner go into that very same bush and conduct a search in that area? Yes. And did you see him retrieve anything from that area? Yes. What was it that you retrieved? The handgun. 
Um, now, you didn't deal with that handgun at that point. You didn't put on a property receipt or anything else along those lines. Is that correct? No. Your partner did that? I believe so, yes. But did you see the object at some point later on? I did see it. Um, was it in size and shape, uh, weight, as far as you could tell, consistent with what you may have seen Mr. Seals throw into those bushes? Yes. Did you or your fellow officers also uh, discover fired cartridge cases in that area? Yes. Tell the jury what a fired cartridge case is. Um, we have a semi-automatic handgun. The bullet before it's fired, the uh, projectile is part of the case, uh, casing. And if you fired the gun and the bullet projectile is fired, the spent casing comes out of the gun. Let me show you what's marked as government exhibit seven for identification purposes. Is this similar to what you're talking about? Yes. That part remains where or goes where? Out of the gun. Out of the gun. All right. And where uh, were these fired cartridge cases found in relationship to where Mr. Seals had been standing when you first saw him. Right in the immediate area. Did you um, also at some point in time go up on the porch where you had seen the person run into the house, because the person you had first seen on the porch, you ran into the house? Yes. And did you find any type of uh, markings anywhere on that porch? Yes. What did you find? There was a strike mark from a bullet on the front door of the house. And there was also um, two shell casings on the porch next to the, next, next to the house. Okay. Now, when shell casings come out of a gun, do they normally drop straight down in your, in your experience? No. Do they, do they shoot out to a certain distance either way, left or right? Yes. Let me uh, show you what the mark is government exhibit one for identification purposes. <coughs> Can you see that from where you are also? Yes. Uh, how long have you worked? Wh which district do you work in? 39. And how long have you worked in the 39th police district? About 13 years. Uh, you are, therefore, I assume, familiar with the area of 17th and Butler, is that correct? Yes. And familiar with the area of North 17th Street where all this happened, is that correct? Yes. Um, based on your, uh, and I'm assuming you've been on that street many times, is that fair to say? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, based on your uh, observations, is in the government one reports to be a uh, map of that area. Does that look consistent with what you know as 17th Street and have in those intersections to look like? Yes. I'm going to ask you to look uh, in the binder that's in front of you at exhibits number 25 through 32. The binder right in front of you. And if you just leaf through those, 25 through 32 for, to yourself, first of all. <clears throat> Chance to look at those? Yes. Uh, are you familiar with what's depicted on uh, government exhibits 25 through 32? Yes. And what, what in general do, do they show? That's the, uh, the area where this incident took place. Uh, I want to draw your attention, first of all, to exhibit number 25. And that should also appear on the screen right in front of you as well. You see it there? Yes. And that's not appearing on the jury screen yet, is that correct? 
Uh, tell us, uh, first of all, what, what Government Exhibit 25 depicts. That is the um, 3800 block of 17th Street. Okay. And uh, where is Butler Street, Butler and 17th? Is that depicted on that photograph as well? Yes. Your Honor, we move for the admission of Government Exhibit number 25 and ask that be published to the jury. Any objection? No, Judge. Admit it. Can you show, uh, Officer, uh, where it was, if it's shown on this photograph, where you first saw Brian Seals? Right, can the jury see the photo? Uh, at any time, if, we, if I admit something you don't see it, uh, raise your hand. Uh, this is, uh, just let me comment, this is an electronic courtroom, so we have basically all the exhibits that is shown on your um, uh, screen there rather than <coughs> passing paper around. It saves a great deal of time. You'll have the uh, actual exhibits in paper when you deliver. Go ahead, proceed. Okay. Uh, if you can, uh, is it shown on this, on uh, exhibit number 25 where you first saw Brian Seals when you were coming down 17th and Butler Streets? Yes. Uh, where, where if you actually point to it on the screen, it should make a, a mark. Um, just right around this, this area here. Okay. Hi. So you were part ways down 17th Street when you first heard Mr. Seals, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Let me uh, approach you, Mr. Judge, and release that in an hour. And if you just. Can we see Exhibit 31? Yes. Can you tell, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, well, first of all, what do you see on Exhibit 31, sir? The, uh, the bush. Okay, when you say the, the bush, what, what bush? It's the bush is where uh, my partner. Lost the picture? They're not supposed to have a picture, Judge. We haven't, we haven't moved this in, into admission yet. The, the procedure is that they show it to the witness first and get it if it's admitted. Then okay. You say the bush. What, what bush are you referring to? That's the bush where the, uh, my partner recovered the okay. firearm. Okay. Move to have that admitted to evidence and published to the jury. No objection. No objection. <laughs> Can we see exhibit number 28? Can you tell us what's in exhibit 28, sir? Yes, um, the house that I saw the one male run into, um, the tree where I first observed um, Mr. Seals, and the bush where the firearm was recovered. So Move for admission, Your Honor, of Exhibit 28, and that be published to the jury. Okay, can you show us, uh, Officer, you said that you said, first of all, you saw the porch where the person ran into. Yes. Can you point to where that is on the screen itself? And touch the screen? Okay. Where was it that you first saw uh, the defendant in this case? When you saw that person running it onto the into the porch and, or into the house, rather, uh, right here. And you would refer to a tree. Is that correct? That tree you're talking yes. back to the immediate right. So mm -hmm. the second mark is um, where I first on the sidewalk between the bush and the right. tree. Yes. And, and um, is that where you then saw Mr. Seals turn and start walking in, in your direction? Yes. And that bush that's immediately to the left is that the bush that we saw earlier on on. Government Exhibit Number Thirty One. Yes. Okay. We see Exhibit Number Twenty Nine, please. Can you tell us what's depicted in Exhibit Number Twenty Nine? It's the uh, the tree. Actually, let me. Uh, can you erase those uh, those spots you saw there? Great. All right. So this is the same area we saw just from a different angle, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, move to admit, Your Honor, exhibit number 29 and publish it to the jury. Great, admit it. Can you show us, sir, Jeff?